right. So, um, la late last night I went ahead and posted uh, the project. It's not, the project description isn't totally complete. I'm still working on some of the details of the selective search stuff. Um, but the core of what we are going to be doing in this project is to take this video. Uh, you'll see if you watch, they drive right by, I think, the BMW headquarters in outside, of, I guess, outside of Munich or whatever. Um, it just happens to be I have data for these uh, nice, easy to use data for the German traffic signs. So I went on YouTube and found some guy that drove around in Germany so we can find some road signs. But essentially, you're going to uh, take the video and you're going to uh, process it and try and find signs. Now, one thing you see, it didn't get that sign. Okay. Here it's thinking that there are signs over here, these buildings. These buildings it thinks it's a, um, it's a, a, a no passing for trucks sign. <laughs> Interestingly enough, okay, I think it does, does it get that sign? Maybe it, I can't remember if it doesn't quite get that sign. Okay. Um, your requirement is that you must, have, you must detect at least four different types of signs. Okay. I'm pretty sure it snaps, gets this guy here. This guy here, I think it gets him once. Um, and so yeah, that 38 is the keep right. So you saw it got that one. Then farther down here, it gets some other signs. Let's see. Um, this right up here is where it gets a bunch of them, at least for mine. As it approaches this intersection, it gets this slippery road sign and then hits both of these go straight signs. Interestingly enough, mine never got uh, the, never got the um, yield sign. But it's getting that one right. You can see every so often it hits a tree out here. Uh, see that one right there? I thought that was a yield sign. So instead of seeing the yield sign there, it saw it up here in the trees. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's not perfect. It doesn't catch every sign. It has some false negatives, but overall it does okay. You know, it's getting that sign. Uh, 35 is the code for straight ahead. And that's also 35, so seeing both of those is 35. So this is what we're headed towards. Is to get something that has reasonable performance where you're lo you load in the video, you search, search the image and find where the signs are, and then you put bounding boxes in the, in the image where they are and what the code for the tr sign is, okay? So there's three sort of new things we're doing in this project. One of them is the idea of convolutional neural networks where the input, the features to the convolutional neural network are the individual pixel values. Now, you could do that with a regular multi-layer perceptron and just have tens of thousands of, you know, or, well, in this case we have a 32 by 32, so whatever 32 by 32 times three because there's RGB, you could feed all of those couple thousand or hundreds, maybe a thousand or so inputs to the problem, okay? I mean, you've had, you trained with 20,000 features, so it's not unreasonable, okay? You could feed them into a multi-layer perceptron and you might get decent results, okay? So just simply feeding the pixel values in isn't all that novel, but you don't get great results generally doing that with a multi-layer perceptron. This convolutional neural network takes actually inspiration from how the visual cortex actually works and the architecture of the neural network preserves some of this thing about what's going on in images. Okay, so that convolutional neural network is a new idea that we haven't done before. The other one of having a multi-class classification problem is something we haven't done before. We did, is it a cone or is it not a cone? Is it a face or is it not a face? Here you have 43 different traffic signs and you're going to make a classifier to discriminate 43 different traffic signs. Okay. Then the third interesting thing is that I have not done a sliding window search to produce this. It would be way, way too slow. Okay. As you already know, it was pretty slow even for the cone detection. So um, it, when I was running this, it would run, you know, maybe three or four frames a second on my wussy laptop here, okay? Uh, which is not bad, okay? Um, it could be spit, spit up with, uh, with uh, you know, some sort of parallelization or a more, uh, or a better, better CPU, okay? Um, 
And the way that it was that fast is by using this idea of region proposal, where the sliding window search is essentially an exhaustive search. I'm searching every possible bounding box at every possible scale in the image. And that's what takes so long. It's, like I say, an exhaustive search. We're exhausting all of the possible bounding boxes. And what region proposal does is use some image processing techniques to identify where there might be something of interest in the image. So for example, it's not too hard to see that there's a difference between the sky and the tree. Okay? There's not that much, you know, it's pretty easy to tell there's a difference between the pole and the sky or this stripe and the road. Okay? And so these what are called segmentation algorithms where they will take the image and relatively quickly can give you a proposal for where there might be a region of interest. And if those regions pop up as the actual signs, then you can detect them. Okay? And so this idea of region proposal will be able to speed things up a lot where we're not exhaustively searching every possible bounding box, but looking at where there are likely to be something of interest. So those are the three things that we're going to be exploring in this project. And actually doing the convolutional neural networks is really very easy. In the end, it's very simple to produce them. You don't have to create any features. You just feed the images straight in. So that part of it actually is not very hard and doesn't take that much time once you understand what's going on with them. Okay. Now, today, uh, of the three things that I described there, what we're going to talk about is, this, is the multi-class classification. Okay. And to start off, uh, we're going to cover some things that are sort of a review, sort of preparing us for some of the more complicated things having to do with this multi-class classification and then moving on to the convolutional neural networks as well. Okay, so if we look at a single class classification problem where we have a certain number of hidden nodes and a single output uh, node with a sing there's a single label. And you'll notice I sort of abstracted away what comes before these hidden nodes. For what we're used to, there's just simply the inputs are here. Okay? But as we're going to see, the convolutional neural networks will be much bigger and more complicated and there'll be more stuff there. But basically, I'm interested in looking at what's happening at the, at the very end of the neural network. Where is this last layer of hidden nodes is going into our outputs? So. Uh, these hidden nodes are going to have their values go through some activation function. So the A here is summing all of the weights times the inputs coming into each node. So the A is the sum of all the things coming into the node. And then that value A is then taken if the activation function of it is what leaves out of that node and goes to the next one. Okay, so A is written as a vector because there are, you know, there's every one of these nodes has its own output. Okay, and so I'm having the output of this node, it's the activation function F, and then it's multiplied by its weight. Okay, each one of these links has a weight. And we call the input weights W and the output weights U. So I'm trying to stay with the same notation we had before. So each one of these link, links has a weight associated with it that's multiplied by the output of each one of the nodes. And then, of course, there's a bias. And you'll notice here I went ahead and I, um, oh, and that actually should be a scalar. There should be just a, when there's a single output, there should be a single U0. Um, I need to fix that. It's a little bit uh, of a mistake in, in the notation. Um, and I separated the bias not inside. You know, Before when we looked at the weight matrix, I put the bias inside and we had a bunch of ones with the inputs. I'm just pulling it out uh, just to identify it in a little bit simpler way. Now in this case, I've got each one of the outputs multiplied by each one of its weights. I'm adding in the bias. And then I'm getting this value of B, which is what's going into this node. Okay. Then that B goes through the output uh, activation function, and that's the or uh, activation, or sometimes they call them transfer functions. Those are synonyms. Transfer function is an activation function. Those are synonyms. Okay. And so that this 
activation function for the hidden nodes could be different from the transfer function or activation function for the output node. Okay? Typically, what we've been using are the logistic sigmoids. And this is the equation for the logistic sigmoid. And you'll remember that's sometimes called a squashing function, where it essentially forces the, the output of the node to be between 0 and 1. And that's sort of what we want for a classification problem. Is it that class with a 1, or is it not that class with a 0? So essentially, one way to think about this is that we have some sort of an output here, B, which is really a linear combination of the inputs. Okay? There's a weight multiplied by the input and then a bias. The weight is essentially a slope and the bias is the y-intercept. So B is essentially a linear combination of the inputs. It's a straight line. It can have any value between negative infinity and positive infinity. Okay? And what has happened here is this logistic sigmoid has forced that linear or continuous value to only be between 0 and 1, a digital value, a decision. Is it the class or is it not the class? So that's one way to look at it where I'm using, a, uh, using, the, using this linear combination of the weights and then I'm using the transfer function to force that continuous value into a binary value. Okay? Now, once we have the output n of the neural network, okay, I want to look at what is the n for all of the samples in my training set. So this ni represents the i samples output. Okay? I take a forward pass through the neural network. I put the i samples inputs. I go a forward pass through the neural network and I get the output n for that i input. And then I change what, you know, the next input. So I do that for the first input, do that for the second input, do that for the third input. And I get n1, n2, n3, the output of the neural network for the first, second, third, etc. All, all of the inputs. And so then I compare the output of the neural network with the ground truth label for that particular sample. I square it to make sure that the signs don't cancel. And I sum them and divide by the total amount. This is uh, the this is the uh, root. This is the mean squared error. Okay. So this is the mean squared error of my classification. Ground truth label: what the class should be zero or one. What it's actually being predicted as zero or one. Okay. Now this error is a single scalar value. It's the sum of the square of the error over the entire training set. And it is that single scalar that drives the gradient descent. So I look at, if I change, for example, one of those u's, if I change one of those u's, does it make the error go up or down? If it makes the error go up, I want to change that u in the other direction. Okay, so this single scalar value, then I take the gradient of all of the tunable parameters with respect to that error, and that's how I update my neural network to get better. Okay, so again, this is just a review uh, of, of what we've already been looking at. So, I already mentioned this idea of a forward pass. Okay, so we have some input x that goes into our neural network. That input x is multiplied by the weights. Okay? This link has a weight going to that, that uh, node. This link has a different weight going to that node. And this is the, um, the this is node 0. That 0 there is node 0. This 1 there is node 1. That 1 is the first input this zero is the zeroth input. The zeroth input is the bias. Okay, that's just one. Okay, that's why there's nothing multiplied by that. So we take our input x, we multiply it by its weights, we sum together all of them, and that gives us our input, the a that is going into this hidden node. Then that a has the transfer function applied to it, and that's the output that comes out of the hidden node. Then there are the u weights that are multiplied by each one of those values. And then I have my bias that I add. That gives me my b, which is the value of this node. And then 
And that's the sum of these two pieces. The sum of that plus that gives me b. Okay. Then I have take the transfer function of that, my output transfer function, and that gives my, 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 my neural network's output. Okay. This is the forward pass. I put in an input. I go forward through the neural network and get what the output is. Then I do that many times for all my different in, for all my different training samples and get my error. Okay. Then the backward pass looks at how much what is the gradient of that error with respect to all of my different weights. Now a lot of times people will write this W here, but that's all of the tunable parameters. That's the W's here. That's the W1 and 0, 0, W00. Zero, zero. It's also the U1 and the U2 and the U0. That's all of the things. In this simple situation where I have two hidden nodes and one output, I've got these four W's, these three U's. Okay? And so, I'm looking at how does the error change when I change any of these tunable parameters. Now, as an example, let's go ahead and just pull out one of those things. Let's look at this guy right here. That's how much does the error change when this particular weight is changed. Okay? And how do we calculate that gradient? Because it's really just a calculus problem. Okay, so we want to know how much does the error change when I change that particular weight. Now, we can start with this equation here. And we see this equation here, there's no W10 in there, is there? No W10. Okay, but W10, this N depends on W10. If I change W10, the N will change. So what I need to do, and I'm sorry about this, we're going back to calculus, we need to apply the chain rule. Okay? So in order to know how much E changes when I change W, first I need to know how much does E change when N changes. And I need to know how much does N change when that W changes. Okay? So that derivative, that partial derivative is equivalent to these two chained together. First, how much does the error change when n changes? And then how much does n change when w10 changes? Okay? Now, unfortunately, there's not just one n. There's many n's. Okay? So all of the n's contribute to the error. So changing the weight will contribute to changing all of the n's. So I need to sum the chain rule applied to all of the different ends. So you can see, you know, the difference here. Sorry, I have first I have just d e d n, but there isn't just one n. There's many ends. I need to sum together the results of all those chain rules. Okay. So now you're getting a very very happy of all the things that happen when you do a n n dot fit. Okay. Now, I'm saying this because it'll help us understand better what's going on when we look at things that are more complicated like a convolutional neural network. And understanding this idea of what's going on with a chain rule will be helpful. Okay. Now, this derivative right here is very easy to take. Okay. I just multiply the 2 out front. Okay. And then I need the derivative of this thing with respect to ni. That's just negative 1. And that's why there's a minus sign out front. Okay, and then all of the other ends, if I'm changed, find how much does E change when I change N1? Okay, well, if I change N1, N2 doesn't change. That's why there's no summation here, because that's the partial derivative where I'm holding all the other things constant. So if I'm changing N1, N2, N3, N4, N5 don't change. So that's why there's no summation left here anymore. Okay. N1's change and N2's change are handled by taking the sum here. So they still play a role, just not in this term. So that's easy enough. We have that derivative. Okay? This guy here is more complex. Okay? Now, what is N? N is F of B. Okay? And so the derivative of Ni with respect to that weight is the derivative of F of Bi. I mean, that's just simply replacing n with f of b and saying that if I'm looking at the ith n, I also need to be looking at the ith b. 
Okay? Now, we need then to apply the chain rule again because B, look here, B does not have W10 in there. We need to apply it again. Okay? This FA can change when W changes. FA2 can change when W changes. U2 and U, U1, U2, and U0 don't change when W changes. Those are constants as far as W1 is, 0 is concerned. Okay? So I need to take the chain rule. How much does F change when BI changes? And how much does BI change when W10 changes? We're just doing the chain rule many times until we get down to W10. Okay? And this is the simplest network there is. There's two hidden nodes and one output. So you can imagine what this is like with this enormous deep neural network. Okay? All right. So we need this term. And what is that term? Well, F in our case is the logistic sigmoid. So what is the change of the output of the logistic sigmoid when the input of the logistic sigmoid X changes? Okay? This is a pretty simple calculus question to do. Okay? And I'll go, uh, when, I'll go through this pretty quickly because I'm not so worried about the details, but basically you can write that to the negative first power, then it's a polynomial, you can multiply negative one out front, you subtract one from the exponent, you take the derivative of what's inside there. Okay? Then you can just clean things up, that's negative two, that goes in the denominator. I can now add and subtract one to the numerator, and then I can group things differently. I can separate those things in groups. You can see some things divide out there. And essentially, I just do some, uh, just some algebra here and get that the derivative is equal to the value of the function times one minus the value of the function. Okay, so this is just a little bit of a algebraic manipulation to make it look different. I mean, really, in the end, you know, you would probably just stop right here. If you just normally take the derivative, you just stop here. Here's an expression for the derivative. And I could go ahead and plug in stuff and I'd be good to go. The reason that I follow this all the way to the end is because you know we're already concerned with doing this as fast as possible and reducing as many calculations as possible. Okay? Now, you'll recall right now we're in the so-called backward pass where we have the error and we're trying to find how to update the weights by going backwards to the chain rule to find how the weights are changing. Okay? We have already done the forward pass to get there. We've already done a forward pass through the network to get the error. And the forward pass, I've already calculated the f of the x. I've already calculated what is the output of the node. I already have that value. So I've already calculated f of x. In order to do the backward pass, I just need to take my fx, subtract, one, subtract it from 1, and then multiply it again. So rather than doing all of these calculations, I just do some simpler, faster calculations because I already know fx. So it's a little bit of a way to speed things up. It's not necessary, but it speeds things up. Okay. So now we know what the derivative of f is with respect to bi. It's whatever f of bi is times 1 minus f of bi. And we've already calculated f of bi in the forward pass. So we now have what we were looking for, and it's pretty easy to calculate. Okay. So we already had calculated this guy. We just now figured out what this guy is. Okay. Now we need to know how much does bi change when I change w10. Okay. Now, how much does b change when I change w10? Well, what is b? B is this equation right here, right? Okay. So I need to take the derivative of this with respect to w1. Well, this thing can change when w1 changes, but u1 is essentially a constant. So u1 is out front as a constant, and then I need how much does f change, how much does f of a change when w10 changes. And then that's a constant, so when I take the derivative with respect to w1, that just goes away. That just goes away. u2 is a constant, and I have df of this, so I have this piece here. So I need to know how much does f of a change when w10 changes and how much does f of a2 change when w10 changes. Those are the two pieces I need. And I need to apply the chain rule again. f with respect to a1, a1 with respect to w10. f with respect to a2, a2 with respect to 10. OK? 
okay? So these now fill in what I needed down here, okay? Now, these guys, if we used a sigmoid, we already know that. We already know what the derivative of those are with respect to their inputs because they're sigmoid, the same thing as what this was, okay? These guys are what we're after, okay? A1, this is A1 here. So how much does A1 change when W10 changes? X. X. We finally got to the bottom of things. I can answer. How much does this thing change when W1 changes? X. Okay? So this thing right here is just simply X. Now XI, whichever I thing we're looking at, whichever NI we're looking at. Okay? Then this one here. How much does A2 change when W10 changes? Nothing. That's zero. Hey, look, we get to get rid of something. That's zero. Goes away. Okay? So here now, we need to sum this up for all of the different NIs. Here's all that we, we know what to plug into each one of those places now. So we have explicit equations for how much that gradient is. Wow, that was awful. That was really painful. Okay? You don't ever have to do this. Okay? That's what hey, that's what dot fit does for you. Okay? But we have to have a little bit of perspective to help us understand when we get to more complicated convolutional neural networks. Okay. So, essentially, we're applying the chain rule to go, follow the error backward and go back and trace them to all the weights and biases and how much they affect changes in the error. Okay? I've programmed these things from scratch and they are not fun. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Now, that's for a single class classification. Okay. How do we go now to do multiple class classifications? So now our output is going to have lots of different nodes. In our case, there's going to be 43 of them for each one of the different traffic signs. Okay. Each one of these is going to have an output n we would probably just say, well, let's just go ahead and use a sigmoid. We used sigmoids before. Let's go ahead and use sigmoids. All right, that's fine. Okay, then I can go ahead and take the sum squared error as my error. Okay, but, okay, we need to take into account here, we now have multiple outputs. So I'm looking at the ground truth value for the I sample but the jth output, okay? So this right here is the error for the ith sample. And I'm summing over j here where j is all of the outputs. So I need to sum how much are all of these different outputs wrong for this ith sample. And then I need to go ahead and sum over all of the samples. So I'm going to have a double sum here. I need to sum the errors over all of the outputs and sum over all of the samples to get the total single scalar E that is the total error summed over all outputs and all samples. Okay. And that then, I need to back propagate that all the way back to all of my weights and biases to know how to change them. Okay could work just fine, okay? But notice one thing. It's possible for multiple ones of these outputs to be true. Each one of these outputs is independent of one another. And it's possible that the, that the neural network could say, I say that class, it's both, that yield sign is one, stop sign is one, and all the other signs are zero. And you're like, what do I make of that? The neural network told me that it's equally confident that, that there's, there, there's two signs, that if there's a one, that it is for sure that class for two different signs. That doesn't make much sense, okay? What we would prefer is that it said, if it was one for those two and zero for all, all the others, we would prefer it says, well, I'm equally confident that it's both yield and stop, but that essentially means they're not ones, they should both be 50%. If I'm equally confident to stop in a yield 
and certain that it's none of the others, I should be giving it's 50 percent likely a stop and fifty percent likely a yield. I shouldn't say I'm a hundred percent that it's both. Okay? It would make more sense if I say it's fifty percent one or the other. Because then it's not really sure. I mean, if you get that sort of a classification, what are you gonna do? You're gonna flip a coin and say it's a stop sign and then you know, or it's a yield sign, then you blow through the stop sign. I mean, you need to know, I'm only 50% confident that it's either a yield or a stop. You need to know that, okay? So this is not the best way to encode our outputs because I could have more than one class that is true. Okay, I'd rather have it give me a probability of how much it's certain about something. So we're going to use a function called a softmax. Now this is different because you notice, let me go back, okay? The output of net of the output one is only dependent on the cert how the output of class one. Okay? The output of node one is only dependent on what it thinks about class one. It's not the output of class one is not dependent on any of the other class what it thinks about any of the other classes, and that's actually the key problem. We want the output of all these different classes to actually look and see. Well, was he just as certain as, as of the guy next door? And if he was, I should update myself. And that's the idea here where you'll see that the outputs B, B1, B2, B all the way up to BM, they're involved in each one of them. And essentially what we have here is something in the numerator that normalizes the output. Essentially, I'm summing over all of the outputs so that the outputs will all sum to one. I mean, we've done normalization there. I mean, there's two things that are going on here. First, I've got exponentials of the outputs, and then I'm normalizing so that it sums to one, okay? And so that, that denominator there will make it sum to one, and that basically gives a probability. So that situation where I had one for stop, one for yield, and all the others, this thing will give me 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, I'm 50% certain of that it's either a stop or a yield. Okay, so that's a little bit different that the output that this output actually depends on the values of the other output nodes, which is different than what we've seen before, but gives us an effect that we like. Now, what happens when I'm looking at the exponential? Why why is this idea of the exponential going on here? Now you'll recall before that we were looking at this thing being a linear or continuous value that could have a value from anywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity. And what happens when I take the exponential of that range of negative infinity to positive infinity? What's the exponential of negative infinity? Zero. Zero. Thank you, Jeremy, the human calculator. Okay. What is the exponential of infinity? Infinity, okay? So before we use the sigmoid to take this continuous thing and squash it between zero and one, now we're using the exponential and we're squashing it to be between zero and infinity. So we sort of did a half squash, okay? And that's what this figure is here. So for any input n, if I have a very small, a small negative, don't have to actually be that small, just negative three gives me basically already zero, and positive three already gives me 20, and it even goes up farther from there, okay? So this exponential is making sure that things that are very, very small or very low values are set to zero. And that's sort of what we're after. We're trying to get things to go from zero to one. So at least we've taken care of the bottom half of things here. Okay, so small activations give near zero probability and large activations are clearly dominant. Okay, so if I get something that's relatively large compared to the others, it's going to for sure dominate because taking the exponential of a, of a number greater than one makes the number bigger. Okay, now, instead of using the sum squared error, we usually, in this type of classification problem, use a thing called cross-entropy, just because we want to be complicated, 
Okay. Now, the idea of entropy, um, I was mo first introduced to entropy because I'm a mechanical engineer and I took thermodynamics. We talk about the second law of thermodynamics and entropy and increasing entropy principle and all this cool stuff and black holes and all his theory of entropy and, and all that sort of stuff. Okay. That's one way to think about entropy, okay? There's another way to think about entropy from an information science perspective. And this idea of entropy is actually the core idea of what goes on into cryptography and encryption. This idea of entropy and how much information is stored in, in, in certain number of bits. There, there's some really good theoretical reasons why this idea of entropy is interesting, okay? Even within computer science completely separate from mechanical engineering, okay? Now, the equation for this cross entropy is this weird thing here, okay? And like I said, there's all sorts of wonderful theoretical background for why this might be interesting, but we're gear done engineers. We wanna see what's, ha what's actually happening with this equation. Why is this equation useful for us, okay? So, what we've got here, this is the ground truth value for the ith sample and the jth output. And this is the prediction for the ith sample and the jth output. So for whatever reason, I'm taking the log of the prediction and multiplying it by the ground truth value, and I'm gonna sum them together and I got a minus sign out here, okay? Well, we'll get into the details of what's going on there, okay? But essentially, just like we had before, this is the error in the ith sample. I need to go ahead and sum over all of the samples to get the total sum for the error. Again, this is a scalar value. I'm going to take the derivatives of that with respect to the output, with respect to all the weights to get how much they should change. Now, I just have different chain rules to do. Now I need to do the chain rule on this with derivatives of logs. I need to do the chain rule on this, which is much more complicated because every one of the outputs is inside of every one of the outputs. So the chain rule gets more complicated, even though the core idea is the same. I just apply the chain rule until I get back to the original thing. It's just more complicated in the math, but you don't have to do it. Okay. Now, let's look a little more closely here. The ground truth values are actually simpler than you, what you might think. They're either zero or one. It is this class or it is not this class. So the Y can only be a binary choice, okay? The classification, the prediction here can vary between zero and one, okay? So if we're gonna plot what this function looks like, okay? This guy right here, the negative that stuff, I'm plotting what that function looks like. I need to look at one case when Y is zero and one case when Y is one. Okay, the y equals zero case is wonderful. Zero times anything is zero, right? Okay, so y, when y is zero, it doesn't matter what n is, I always get zero for that value of cross entropy. Okay, and then I have negative log of something. Okay, now a log of a value between zero and one is a negative number. Jeremy probably remembers that because he's the human calculator. Okay, so if I take the log of something between zero and one, it's gonna be negative. That's why there's a minus sign out front of here to make sure these are positive numbers. So that's where that mysterious minus sign, what it's for, okay? So what does this mean? What does that graph mean, okay? Now when y is equal to one, that means it is that class for sure. That's the ground truth value. So it is for sure that class when y is equal to one. Now. If the n is high over here, okay, that means I get it correct. If n is 1 and y is supposed to be 1, that means I got it right. If n is 0 and y is supposed to be 1, that means I missed a detection. That's a missed positive, okay? So when I have a missed positive, I add to the error. When I have a correct detection, I don't add anything to the error. Okay, see that? And when I have a missed detection, the closer and closer that output is to zero, I actually go off to infinity. So if my prediction is zero, I add an infinite amount to my error. You're like, holy crap, that's really bad. I should never be adding infinity. So I'm gonna get a divide by zero or something, okay? you actually won't get a divide by zero because of the soft max. The soft max saves you, okay? Look at what's going on here in the soft max, okay? 
those b's, they can't all be zero. Okay? If they were all zero, then I have zero over zero and I have an infinite output. But they're never going to be all exactly zero. There's going to be something that's not exactly zero. So even, even, if this, even if one of them was exactly zero, one of the others is not going to be exactly zero. And so something in the denominator is going to be non-zero even if the numerator is zero. Okay? And so essentially something is always going to have some small value. Nothing's ever going to be exactly zero because there's going to be something there. Because the e, the only way e to something can be zero is if it's negative infinity. So the only way I can get exactly zero is if the output of that node was negative infinity. Because if I have negative infinity, e to the negative infinity is zero. So even e to the negative 100 million is not quite zero. No, because remember these things are these things are linear combinations. There's no way you can take a linear combination of finite inputs and get a in negative infinity value. So it's not possible to have negative infinity for that and take e to negative infinity and get zero. So the way the softmax is with its exponential prevents the cross entropy from ever blowing up. So the combination of softmax and cross entropy are really good. They're symbiotic. Okay? So if I have something that's close to zero, it adds a lot to the error. That's really bad. So really I'm punishing if I'm missing detections, I punish the error severely. Good question. Because what happens with a false positive? Okay? A false positive is when you say it is the class, but the ground truth is actually zero. Okay? So a false positive is the orange line, but with n being close to 1. And look at that, Jeremy. If n is close to 1 and y is zero, I add nothing to the error. I get a get out of jail free card. If I have a false positive, it doesn't add anything to the error. Whoa, that seems weird. So it's not punished for false positives. Very strange. Okay, so that's actually, you first look at that and you're like, whoa, how can this, this is, this is what everybody uses. How can they use this? Because it doesn't punish false positives. Now, the trick is in the back propagation step. Okay, because what's going to happen is that the, it's never going, it's, it, if it's a false positive, then the correct class has something there. There's some small amount in the correct class. Okay? And that correct class was a missed detection. So the error, the back propagation is going to go back and try to increase the value for the missed detection. It's not going to go back and try to decrease the value of the false positive. It's going to go back and try to increase the the missed positive. And when I go back and increase the missed positive, because there's all of this cross linkage in the softmax, if I increase the false, if I increase the missed detection, that forces the false positive down indirectly. So even though the error doesn't explicitly penalize for false positives, it will decrease the false positive by increasing the missed detection because the things have to sum to 1. By using the softmax and making them sum to 1, increasing the missed detection automatically decreases the false, the missed, the false negative. False positive, I mean. Okay? So again, the interaction between the softmax and the cross entropy work well together, so I concentrate on getting the detections better rather than trying to avoid false, neg false positives. And in the end, I make the false positives uh, better. Restlessness means that I've run out of time. So uh, that's where we'll stop for today. Um, this idea, you'll see the name of this slide is called a multinomial logistic classification.
okay? The multinomial, that's many classes. The logistic means I'm using exponentials or logarithms. You can see that in the cross entropy. And classification obviously means classification. So that's the standard way using the softmax and cross entropy is the standard way of doing multi-class classification. And it even has a fancy name, multinomial logistic classification. And we'll pick this up on Wednesday and maybe get to some CNN stuff, convolutional neural network stuff too. Okay. Hold on, I'm trying to make this stop. It's <laughs> done. There we go.